Thank you very much, Luis, for this very kind introduction. Uh, actually, this uh, paper will be an illustration of, of what uh, Luis said about my taste for uh, uh, taking theory to data, and also of what uh, Aloisio says about, I, and this is something I, I deeply believe, which is one of the, of, uh, one of the reason why we, we like to talk to each other. The, if you want to understand reality, data don't speak by themselves. You need a theory, and you need to put things in order is the most possible rigorous way. Otherwise, it's very easy to, to, uh, to reach completely false conclusion. Uh, on the other hand, if you're a theorist, you might choose to remain in your ivory tower, or you may try to talk about the real world, and this paper, I, we, we are trying to do exactly this, talk about the real world. Uh, so most of my presentation, actually, there will be data. At some point, there is, a, there is a, some theory behind, and I will allude to the theory, but I will not um, uh, inflict on you a precise description of the, of the theory itself. Uh, the talk will be based on two papers, which are here, uh, none of which is, is, uh, is published. Um, let me start with the facts. What kind of facts are motivating this, uh, this work? Uh, and there, there are two things that I, that I want to show you. Um, the first one is inequality. Now, uh, we all know that inequality has, in has been increasing in many countries, actually in most countries, over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, it's very clear in the US, it's very clear in the UK, it's very clear in, uh, in many European countries and also in very developing countries. Actually, in China, it, it has been an obvious part of the, of the development. Um, now, there are plenty of reasons. There is a huge literature on the causes for inequality, but one aspect which has been pointed out is in particular by demographers is uh, the role of assortative matching in, um, in this increase of inequality. Now, this is not very surprising. Take two, two unequal uh, population of men and women. Match them randomly. And then take the same two populations but match them, match them assortatively. You know, with the, the, the wealthier or the, or the most educated together and so on. In the second matching, you will have much more inequality. That's clear. The question is to quantify this. So uh, according to Berkeley, um, uh, one six up to 20% of the, of, the, um, of the increase in inequality comes from this, uh, and there is some re a recent paper, and there is this one, and one of the one, the, one of the co-authors is in the room, uh, and there, this, this, there is this very striking statement: take uh, matching, uh, take the population uh, in 2005 and match them according to the 1960 matching pattern. The Gini, you do that, the Gini drops from 0.43 to 0.35. So there is, now I'm not sure I believe that amount, that seems huge, but I think we, there is really something here, which is uh, part of the increase in inequality has to do with matching, has to do with who marries me. Uh, but there are plenty of questions. Uh, and in particular, this very simple sentence, let's take the current population and let's match them according to the matching patterns of the 1960. What does it mean? How do you do that? See. When you have a matching game like this, you got two population, and then you got a resulting matching, which is some people marry some other people. Uh, if you change the population, of course, obviously, the outcome will be different, but what part of the difference will be caused to just the change in the marginal population, keeping the matching patterns constant, and what part would be due to changes in, in matching pattern? Actually, how do you even define the matching patterns or preference for assortativeness or anything. There is another trait which, uh, which I would like to mention here because it will be important for my paper. Uh, matching on what? Are we talking about income? Are we talking about wages? Income is probably a very poor choice because income is endogenous. Income is the outcome of a decision, which is a labor supply decision. Uh, so it could be that things that looks like huge change in matching in income simply result in very small change in, in labor supply decision. The same people marrying the same people but making different uh, decisions. So I, I would take the, the stand that the real thing we're interested in is matching on human capital, which is what I'm, I'm going to talk about. So that's the first uh, fact, which is authoritative matching and inequality. Uh, here is the second fact. Let me start with the graph. Let me say a few words about this graph. It's, uh, it's, in, the, it's in a paper by uh, Gary Becker, Kevin Murphy, and Hubbard. 
on the right hand side of the graph, you got uh, rich country. On the left hand side, you got poor countries. And the definition of rich and poor is simply GDP per capita above or below the median. The size of the bar, so we, you got uh, decades from 1970 to 2010 on both sides. The size of the graph is the percentage of the population with a college degree. And the dark blue men, the light blue uh, women. So the graph speaks uh, by itself. In developed countries now, women are more educated than men. And even in developing countries, it's not yet totally the case, but the trend is very clear. I think this is a hugely important phenomenon, which we tend to disregard, but this is structural. This is much more important than the fact that the, that the current interest rate in Switzerland are negative, because this is uh, a kind of structural change that will be with us for decades and might have a huge impact. So it's exactly what I want to look at. Now, let's look at the US now. You take uh, every year from 1960 to 2006, you take, for any given year, the, the population aged 30 to 40, and the com you compute the percentage of this population with some college, which is the solid line, a college degree, which is the dashed line, and college, what we call college plus, which is low degree, MD, uh, PhD, MBA, and so on. That's the dotted line. Men are in blue, women are in red. So the first thing you see which is exactly confirms what I said before, is that women are more educated than men. They have overtaken men in, uh, all, uh, at all levels. But let's concentrate on this, what's going on here between the, the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and now. One thing we know for a fact is that the return to education, what's, uh, what's usually called the college premium, the difference in wage that you get uh, by getting a college degree vis-a-vis -vis a high school degree has been increasing a lot, and even more so for the College Plus premium. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not really readable, but uh, this is the college premium for men, and this is the college premium for women. The decade, uh, that's the decade, people born, uh, born in the 40, people born in the 50, people born in the 60. So we have this very clear increase in the returns to education. Now, we're economists, we believe in incentives, so we believe that if you increase the return to an investment, people should invest more. And you see that big time for women. The proportion of women with a college plus degree was about 3% here, now it's 11%. Again, that's huge. You cannot underestimate the size of a change like this over a relatively short period. We're only talking about three decades. I mean, this look at the variation about, if you look at the variation over the previous decades, it's, uh, it's uh, trivial. But what's even more stri striking here is that you see this huge response for women, uh, for men you see exactly nothing. If anything, it's slightly decreased. Now, why do we have this huge asymmetry between genders? You face a bunch of people with the same types of incentive, some of them over respond, some, uh, some, of, uh, some, uh, some of them don't respond at all. What's the explanation? What's the impact on intra-household allocation? Now, what part, part of, the, of the work that, that, that Luis was, alluded, uh, was alluding to uh, was aimed at, at showing, and I think that, that now we have established, that uh, the decision of the household depends on the distribution of powers within the household. That if you somehow can transfer power from one spouse to the other, you might end up uh, changing the decision and including decision in important direction like investment on children, health, education, and so on. And uh, so, last question, what would be the impact on household behavior? Okay, so why do we have this kind of, uh, this kind of asymmetry? So let me first sketch an explanation without any kind of, any kind of equation. That's a theoretical explanation that, that was in a paper that was published in 2009. It's a joint paper with uh, Murati Yigun and, uh, and Yoram Weiss. Uh, but it's easy to tell the story. I mean, the, the model itself, it's a bit contrived, but, but let me tell you just the story. Uh, when you invest in education, you get two types of benefits. The first type, everybody knows about, it's the college premium that you get on the labor market. You are less likely to be unemployed, your wage will be higher, the, the career will be steeper, and so on and so forth. Now, this has been studied a lot if only because it's directly observable. Well, it's not directly observable, by the way, because you, know, you have selection issues which are difficult to, to take care of, but at least there is some uh, 
you can see what's going on. But what's striking is you don't see any difference between men and women. And uh, that was very clear on the, on the graph that I showed before. If anything, the, the college premium increased faster for men than for women. So you cannot explain the asymmetry of investment between genders by just looking at this uh, return, the return that you get on the labor market. But there is another set of return, and those are the ones you perceive on the marriage market. With different levels of education, uh, you will have different marriage probability. Conditional on marriage, you will not marry the same spouse. Conditional on whom you marry, the surplus generated will not be the same. And conditional on the size of the surplus, the distribution of the surplus will not be the same. Now, the kind of point we're making in the theory paper is that those types of benefits, they have been neglected. They have not been considered at all. And there is no, absolutely no reason to believe that they are symmetric across genders. Actually, I'm going to show you some kind of, later on in the talk, some kind of empirical evidence that clearly shows that they are completely asymmetric. So if you want an asymmetry between genders that could explain what we see, that's a possible response. Uh, now, of course, this might have an impact. If we, we must recognize that if there are two types of benefits to education, there are two types of motivation to acquire that education, and we should try to capture that in a model. Now, of course, the point is, unlike the college premium, the labor market premium, which you can directly observe on the data, this you cannot. Those two, the, the change in marriage probability and the change in the, in the education of the spouse, you can look at that in the data, and actually I will show you some graph later on, but it's very hard to evaluate the value, the monetary value of those changes, and the last two, you, there is no way you can identify them if you don't have a structural model. So definitely you need a structural model. Now, this is a public economic theory conference, so let's talk a little bit about policy issues and uh, a related uh, uh, aspect. Let's take any kind of uh, policy question. For instance, what are the consequences of, say, a tax reform? The standard way of dealing with this kind of question would be the following. Let's look at the impact on behavior. Now, what kind of behavior are we going to look at? Typically, labor supply. So it can be state, uh, static labor supply, you know, how many hours are you working uh, as a result of the reform? It can be a more dynamic aspect. When are you going to retire, for instance? If, if you want to go dynamics, you better look at savings. Uh, and there could be something else. You could like at risk taking, you could like an innovation, you could look at innovation and all this stuff. But there is something common here in, in, in the papers doing this. They, they, there are some, some factors that they consider as uh, exogenously given in the sense that they are not affected by the reform, is the distribution of human capital within the population and the marital pattern. So that's what I would call the short or medium term perspective. And it's extremely useful. We learned a lot, in particular, all the work on the, the effect of tax reform on labor supply of, of Blundell and, and the UCL people and Eggman and others. Uh, I think we learned a lot. But if we really want to evaluate the impact, we should also consider the long term consequences, i.e. we should consider the impact on the distribution of human capital. And if you think of it, there is a double impact. The first impact is uh, if you change taxation, you will change the returns on, uh, on human, uh, of investment in human capital. So presumably you will change the level of investment. And there is this indirect effect that uh, you might change the matching patterns. For instance, if you reduce the economic gain through a, um, a progressive taxation, if you reduce the economic gain of, uh, uh, of education, well then probably in the matching patterns, the non-economic aspect will be more important, uh, but that in turn has an influence on investment as I tried to argue on the previous slide. So this is exactly what we want to capture. Again, we need a structural model. Okay, that's a problem. What, what's the tool? What, are the, what kind of models are we going to use? Uh, this is a one slide summary of matching under transferable utility. So it will be uh, slightly incomplete. But let me tell you what, the, what I see as the basic idea of this literature. And let me mention that the, the, the person, the, 
matching models with transfer or utility were introduced in economics in an old paper by um, Koopmans and, uh, and Beckman, and then pretty much simultaneously uh, by uh, Shapley and Schubik and by Becker. But this, this kind of idea that you could use this model to think about the market for marriage in, in some deep structural way, that's really one of uh, Becker's contribution. I think it's one of the, the deepest and most influential uh, Beckerian contributions. So let me briefly describe what the theory looks like. First of all, uh, how do you define the matching game under transferable utility? Uh, there are two populations, X and Y. Now think of X as the set of characteristics of, say, women, and Y as the set of characteristics of men. Each of them, uh, well, I will concentrate in this talk about human capital, but you could, you could put plenty of them. And each population is, is endowed with a particular measure. And then you have a surplus function, so the surplus function, so this tells you who are the people uh, on, the, on the scene, and uh, this surplus function tells you if you take Mrs. X and, uh, and uh, she happens to be married with Mr. Y, what kind of economic and non-economic gain will this uh, matching generate? That's the definition of the problem. What do we call a solution? What do we call a matching? A matching is defined by two things. Actually, uh, if you want to define a matching, you need to answer two questions. The first question is who's marrying whom? And for technical reasons that will become clear in a minute, uh, Instead of self of, of considering a function between the space between the, the two space between the space X and the space Y, telling you Mrs. X will be matched with Mr. Y, it's much better to consider a measure on the product space. So gamma, think of gamma as gamma of X Y is the probability that that Mrs. X is ma is uh, married with Mr. Y. In particular, you may have you may have a mixed strategy. It may be the case that the same X might be matched with positive probability with 2Y. And you need this because in some of those models, the only equilibrium involves uh, this kind of randomization. But that's not enough. In addition, you need to answer the second question, which is assuming that those two guys marry, how will the surplus will be, uh, be distributed? Which means that you need two functions, U, U, U of X and V of Y. Uh, so that's what she will get, that's what he will get. And it must be the case that what she gets plus what he gets is equal to the surplus, gamma almost everywhere, namely for any couple who, uh, who marry with positive probability. Now, I say that I, one of the reasons why I was interested in is I was interested in the, the allocation of power within the household. We know that it's important what we want is a theory that will allow us to endogenize this, this uh, allocation of power. Where does this power come from? We could use matching, mo we could use, sorry, bargaining model and so on and so forth. But note that this is exactly, if I can find this U of X and, and V of Y, which are part of the solution, that's exactly what I'm looking for. This is telling me how the surplus is distributed. What do we call stability? That's exactly, exa exactly the same result that um, Marinda Sotomayor presented yesterday. A machine is stable if for any X and Y, including the one, especially the one which are, were not married, we have this inequality. And why that? It's pretty obvious. Assume that you don't have this. Assume that a couple violates. You have a strict inequality here. You can tell, you can tell two things. First of all, they are not married, because otherwise they will have an equality. And second thing, they should be married. Because the size of the pie that they would generate is enough, would be enough to, to, to give each of them more than what they have. That's the violation of stability. Remember that the definition of stability is, or maybe I should remind this, although it was uh, very clear in, uh, in Marilda's uh, talk yesterday, definition of stability is you cannot find a man and a woman who are not married together for the moment, but who b both be better off if they were married together instead of their current situation. So it's divorce at will, if you wish. Uh, if that was the case, they would divorce and they will rematch. That's the definition of stability, so that's the translation of this definition. Okay, now comes the main result of all this literature. Forget about stability. Stability is a game theoretic concept, right? It's, uh, so it, it's, there is this idea of there is a decentralized game which is being played by the agents. Forget about this and put, you, put yourself in the shoes of a social planner. So you're the guy who can choose who's going to marry whom, and the one thing you want to do is maximize total surplus. This animal here. You want to choose the measure gamma in such a way that this integral here is maximized. 
Of course, there are some limitations on what the way you can choose the gamma, just because the marginals of gamma are given. The marginal distribution of couples is the distribution of men. The marginal distribution of couples uh, regarding Y must be the given distribution of women. So think of the following problem, maximizing this integral here with respect to gamma within the set of measures or with given marginals. The basic remark here is this is a linear problem. The unknown is the, the measure. This maximum here is linear in the measure and those conditions are linear in the measure. If this is a linear program, we can look at its dual. You write the dual program of this, the dual will be a minimization. The dual will, will introduce two functions, u of x and v of y. The maximum will be, uh, will be the minimization of an integral of u and v, but the conditions would be exactly those, exactly the stability condition. So there is this result which tells you that the matching is stable if and only if the measure maximizes total surplus that was already in both Becker, uh, Chaplet, Schubig, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's a very deep result, and that gives you a lot of mileage. Because, for instance, exist an existence of a stable match in general is, is, can be a very difficult problem. Here, piece of cake. You just need to prove existence to the solution to, uh, of a solution to a linear maximization problem. You don't need much. I mean, if you put some compactness assumption on X and, uh, and uh, some minimal uh, uh, Amy continuity condition on S, you got that. And you actually, you got even more. You got something like generic uniqueness. I don't want to, uh, to enter into the technicalities, but assume that you have a finite population on both sides. Well, essentially, you're maximizing. You have a set of number, and you're choosing the, the measure that, 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 that will give you the highest number. In general, this is reached only an, at one point. It might be reached at, at, at two points, but this is, this is a knife edge situation, and that would not be a robust deviation. So you got something like uh, generic units of the measure, not of the function u and x. That's, that's a different stuff. And all this is coming through duality. Now, this type of problem, uh, maximizing, uh, maximizing an integral like this under a condition on the marginals, uh, uh, they are known in mathematics as optimal transportation problem, and it's the a kind of problem that have uh, attracted a lot of attention, including recently, for instance, Cédric Villani, who received uh, the Field Medal uh, like six years ago or something like this, uh, has a book on this, and there, there's been a lot of progress uh, on this, and that's an interesting situation because there are new results, new mathematical results, which happen to be extremely useful for economic analysis and conversely. Last but not least, in a one-dimensional setting, uh, assortative matching, uh, we get assortative matching if and only if the surplus is super modular. So assume that people match on one characteristic, which is human capital, and we have a natural order on both sides. Uh, assortative matching means uh, high people ma ma match with high people. The only thing you need is super modularity. And super modularity simply means that if you take two men and two women, it's better to match the, the, the most educated men with the most educated women than to mix. See, and that, that's, that's obvious, right? Because you want to maximize this sum, so. Fine. We have a question. We have the technical tool. Let me tell you what the story I'm going to tell you technically looks like informally, and then I will come. I will inflict on you some, something a bit more formal. Here is the way, here is the claim that in our paper, the how do we explain those evolution and in particular the increase in inequality, the increase in assortative matching and this asymmetry across genders. The first thing is there is one basic, deep, important structural trend which is the increasing importance of human capital. That's, that's what I said before. It's much more, it's always been good to be educated but it's much more uh, important now than it used to be 30 years ago. But that's true not only for the parents but also for the children. You have children, it's much more important to educate them than it used to be 30 years ago. But as a result, why is it that people marry? And this here I will be completely Beckerian. They, they, they marry because there are some economic 
gains to marriage, while there are economic and non-economic gains, but let me concentrate on the economic gains. And the economic gains have to do with domestic production. But the story has changed, in particular the kind of story that, that Becker emphasized used to be valid and is much less valid now. The Beckerian story was chores specialization. You know, uh, you need to uh, clean the dishes, clean up the houses, whatever, and, uh, and it's efficient for one person to specialize and the other, the other person goes on the market. That's, that was uh, Becker's theory. Uh, which was true, you know, back, which was a bit, largely true back in the 50s, 60s. Incidentally, one implication of this theory, which has never been true, is that this kind of theory should lead to negative associative matching. And this has never been in the data. And Becker's knew it. It's, it's, one in, it's one of his papers. But then there is the alternative gains. So my st our story is this is much less important now than it used to be. Uh, on the other hand, the human capital production, the fact that you have children and you want to invest in those children, that is crucial. And one thing I want to emphasize is it's crucial at the top of the distribution. So when I was saying that the college premium has been increasing, People have been looking at the returns on education at all levels. So not only what difference does it make to have a PhD as opposed to uh, uh, a BA or a BA as opposed to some college, but also uh, being a high school graduate as opposed to high school dropout, to having some college as opposed to a high school uh, diploma. At the top, as I told you, it increased a lot. At the bottom, it did not increase at all. Actually, ac according to a recent paper by uh, David Alter, it slightly decreased. So this story of increased uh, importance of education, it's the story at the top of the distribution, not at the bottom. In conclusion, I will try to argue that those are huge implications in terms of inequality now in the future. What we see here are very strong tendencies that pushes societies in the direction of increased inequality. I'll come back to that. Now, from an economic point of view, we have two production functions, but they are completely different. This human capital production function has two characteristics which are crucial. The first one is human capital of the parents is a crucial input. And this we know for a fact. There's been plenty of empirical work showing this. You don't need a PhD or even a, a BA to wash the dishes, but if you want to educate your kids, being educated yourself helps a lot. And the second thing, even more important, is parental input or complement, not substitute. In other words, uh, if when it comes to washing the dishes, my, my time and my wife's time are perfect substitute. She can do it, I can do it, uh, doesn't make any difference. We call, when it comes to uh, education, it's probably much better to have both the husband and the wife being involved uh, than just one of them specializing. specializing. Specialization is probably not very good in terms of human capital formation. Now what I will try to convince you of is that if you take if you believe in this kind of stuff, this completely changed the incentive for assortative matching. And in terms, it impacts, this impacts the marital college premium and in a completely gender specific way. So that's exactly the answer to the question that I was asking. So this is the general story. Now let me enter into the detail of the model. At some point you have to be a bit more specific, but the model is very simple. We try to keep the model as simple as we can. So. Uh, Investment in children, human capital, we Q is the investment. The future utility of the children is simply uh, Q to the alpha, and alpha will be less than one, so it's a technology with decreasing return, completely standard. The production function uh, of Q is uses parent time in human capital so that the, 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 uh, the time T1 and the human capital H1 of the wife and this is the time T2 and the human capital of the husband. With the beta, we could, we could uh, take the beta to be the same or not, that doesn't really matter. But it's a simple, simple cup Douglas. Now here we're making two assumptions. First of all, that human capital is an input, and second, that the parental incomes are complements. And this has been used in a lot in, the, actually exactly this form of this used in the recent paper by uh, Daniela Del Boca, Chris Flynn, and Matt Wiesel. Labor market wages are proportional to human capital, no surprise here. The chores, just to simplify, it's a fixed time. You need a fixed amount of time to wash the dishes, clean up the, uh, the house, and, uh, and so on. Uh, in a minute, I will argue that the time needed has decreased a lot over the last 30 years, and that has been a driving force. But let's, let's call this fixed time to, uh, tau prime here for the moment. 
Here, ma male and female times are perfect substitute and no human capital is needed, which means that we got specialization here, right? Since uh, I can do it or my wife can do it and uh, doesn't depend on our human capital, uh, the, the efficient thing to do is we, whomever has the, the lower stock of, uh, of human capital specializes. Fine. And lastly, we need utilities. Well, utilities are Cobb Douglas. My utility is my private consumption multiplied by the utility of the kid. And we both care about the utility of the kid, the husband and the wife, which means that the kid is something of a public good. So here's what we have. Now, now we can inject this kind of structure into the general uh, uh, assortative matching framework that I was talking about. The here is the budget constraint. A well-known result in this literature is that when you take this kind of utility, we, you do have transferable utility. This is a model in which there is transferable utility, uh, which means the following, the, the, um, in general, an efficient allocation maximizes a weighted sum of utility, but here, any efficient allocation maximizes just the sum of utility. The weight must be one. Well, it's that the, the standard uh, transferable utility, the Pareto frontier is a straight line with slope minus one, right? So you can solve, so you know what the, the household is gonna do, you can solve, and this is, you know, a, any first year student could solve that. We are solving a, a Cobb Douglas technology, a demand function of a Cobb Douglas technology. Uh, you can compute, therefore, uh, the gain here, the total utility, where K is this animal here. And what do we call the surplus? Well, the surplus is the gain that you get uh, when, you, when you marry two people. Uh, minus what one would get uh, being a single and minus what two would get being a single. So everything I said previously about those matching models, I'm gonna apply it for a function that has this shape here. First result, do we have assortative matching? Piece of cake, we just compute the second cross derivative because assortative matching is linked with supermodularity and supermodularity is fully determined by the sign of the second cross derivative. And what you find is that it's positive. Let, let me emphasize one thing. You take exactly the same model, but in the production function, you don't put human capital, you get a negative sign here, which is exactly Becker's result that if the domestic production does not directly involve human capital, you should have negative assortative matching, but here, on the contrary, you got positive assortative matching. Well, that's good because we know that there is assortative matching in the data, so at least the model is consistent with this. An additional thing, I told you we can recover the utilities, and I'm very much interested in the utilities, but the way I described recovering the utility was not that appealing, because I was telling you I'm gonna write a linear program, and then I'm gonna compute the dual, and that will be the solution on the dual. Well, you know, computing the solution to a dual of an abstract problem, it's not always easy, but here it turns out that there is a very simple trick that, 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 uh, that gives you a beautiful shortcut, Look at this equation here. This is the stability condition, right? What well, this tells you that U of H1 is always larger than S, S of H1, H2 minus V of H2. So if it's always larger, it must be larger than the max. But we know that it's reached at at least one point, which is the couple that actually marries, so it's equal to the max. Take this equation, uh, use the envelope theorem, that's what you get. And what this tells you is those two functions, which explain you how your utility vary with human capital, are identified up to an additive constant, of course. Why is it important? Because remember, I was trying to argue that when you invest, there are two types of benefits, so some that you grab on the, on, the, on the labor market and some that you grab on the marriage market. Let's assume for a minute, which is not too far from, from being true, that what you get on the labor market does not depend on your marital status. The decision you make might depend, but, 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 the, but, the, but the gain is, is, is pretty much the same. So uh, on the one hand, there is what you get on the labor market, but in addition, and that's really what we're interested in because th this is where we can have the asymmetry between genders, in addition, there is what you get on the marriage market. It's exactly this, it's exactly you and me. In a, in a matching model, this, the, the surplus is what you get be because you're married minus what you would get as single. So this tells you the, the surplus here is the total premium due to college education that you get on the marriage market in addition to everything you get on the labor market. 
and this tells you how it's distributed. Now with this interpretation, the, this derivative here is by how much would your utility increase if you slightly increase your stock of human capital. That's exactly what you need to determine the e efficient level of, in of investment. The e efficient level of investment will be such that this guy here is uh, equated to the marginal cost of investment. So, so you can do the computation. There is an interesting remark, which is we have a re what I call a reinforcement. Assume for a minute that uh, H1 is larger than H2, which is the implicit assumption here. There is this tau here, and this tau reflects the fact that person two was a lower wage. We spend, we spend uh, some time on, uh, on chores. So the time available tau, which is one minus tau prime, uh, if the time left will be a bit less because the, uh, he or she is wasting this time. And what this is telling you is that if you got some kind of difference in education at the beginning, this translated to an additional incentive to invest and the people who, are more, who have more incentive to invest are precisely the people who are a higher stock to start with. So which that, that tells you, and you have a lot of this in those kind of models, uh, if there is a small difference at the beginning, the equilibrium will be such that this difference is amplified. It sounds a little bit like the literature on social interaction, you know, that uh, you have two equilibria and uh, it's not because uh, the social interaction, you have typically several equilibria and some of them are inefficient. Here you have only one equilibrium and it's always efficient. But it has the flavor that you have small, small differences that can be amplified by the equilibrium mechanism. Okay, now let me, I'm gonna do two things. First of all, I'm gonna tell you what kind of comparative static prediction we get from this model. And then I will say a few words about how do we take that to data and what's in the data. What are the source of changes in this model? The first thing is the time spent on chores has decreased. And this is, there is a beautiful paper by uh, Jeremy Greenwood and co-authors, which uh, the, the title of which is uh, Eng Engines of Liberation, that argues that one of the major changes in family economics over the last decades is the fact that the time needed for chores has been decreased a lot, a lot. And this is due to technology. It's the fact that you have vacuum cleaners, that, that, that you have washing machines, that you have, um, that, that you have uh, microwaves and so on and so forth. So that's the first determinant of the change, which is this change in time. The second determinant is the increase in the return to, to human capital. It's more important to invest in your children now than it used to be the case. And in our model, theory, remember alpha is the coefficient of Q in the utility. So the very simple translation of this is alpha has increased. And the last thing is wages have increased. Now, it's not, remember, w, the, the wage you receive is your level of human capital multiplied by W. So W is the return that parents receive from their human capital on the, on the labor market, and this has increased too. Those are the three main style as changes that I want to introduce in my model. And then we're gonna ask ourselves, let's take this model, what happens? Uh, what kind of prediction does this model give you uh, if you look at those three changes? So let's start with time use. We sh you should find that total sp uh, time spent on chores decreases. But it's actually what the model tells you is that it should decrease a lot for women and increase a little bit for men. Why that? Because uh, that's part of the reinforcement. More and more women are, are educated, actually more and more women are more educated than the husband, and in those households the, the, the logic is reversed and the, the men will spend time. So you, so you expect a slight increase for men and, uh, and a large decrease for women. What about time spent on children? Here the, uh, the answer is completely unambiguous. It's both the increase in alpha and the increase in tau should increase the time spent with children. It's not obvious in particular, it's not obvious a priori because remember what I'm telling you is, you I have increased human capital and I've increased the return to human capital. So the, the opportunity cost of spending time with the children instead of uh, going on the market and receiving a wage, this cost has increased. Nevertheless, we predict that the time spent by both parents should increase. And if you look into the, the, if you enter the detail, you find that it should increase much more for the husband than for the wife, 
essentially because this ratio H1 over H2 operates in, uh, in opposite direction. Those are simple conclusions. We can check whether or not they're in the data. More interestingly, let's look at the prediction we get on the matching market. Well, you know, that's the good thing with this kind of technology. It takes some time to put it, but then checking properties is a piece of cake. You want to know whether supermodularity increases or decreases, you just, you just look at the, the derivative. You take the second cross derivative between H1 and H2, which is what drives the supermodularity, and you ask yourself, this animal, does it increase or decrease when tau increases, when alpha increases, and when W increases? The answer is everything is increasing. Sorry about this. There is a, a positive sign here, but the slide is a bit too small. So the conclusion is there is an increased tendency to assertive matching, especially at the tau. Now, remember, most of my story, the tau changed for everyone, but the alpha and the W changed at the top of the distribution. So it's mostly a story at the top of the distribution. In practice, how do you do? Here, I'm going to be very quick. It's actually with, with what took us most time when writing the paper, but, but let me just summarize what, what we're doing. There is a first thing that you can do, or that you should do, is that everything I, I put here in this model is, was continuous. In practice, what you observe are discrete. Yeah, yeah, there are five levels of education, things like this. So you have to translate supermodularity and so on in a discrete setting. That's, there is no, no problem here. The second thing is you want to put a stochastic traction. Now, remember, those, are, those models, I love those models, but they are a bit naive, right? Uh, take a matching model with supermodularity. It will tell you there will be assertive matching. Literally, what those models are telling you is the one man with the highest human capital should marry the one woman with the highest uh, human capital, and then the second highest should marry the second highest. You should have perfectly assertive matching. That's what the model predicts. And of course, we don't see that in our data. Uh, real life is, is fuzzy. Uh, we do see correlation, uh, as you, you, you are going to show that. But it's not, the correlation is not one, obviously. Well, so how do you do that? Well, we are in, if you think as an econometrician, there is a lot of heterogeneity among people. Some we observe, which is the human capital. Most we don't observe. How do you deal with this? When you're an econometrician, you introduce unobserved heterogeneity. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to say that if you take Mr. Mrs. I belonging to some, some education class capital I and Mr. J belonging to some education class capital J, the surplus that they generate is the sum of a deterministic part and then there is a random term. Now this is almost the model we take to data except that this is way too difficult. The reason why is this is too difficult is the following. Remember that I'm telling, you, I'm telling you that at the end of the day, we are looking at the dual of uh, linear maximization problem. Now, this is a stochastic structure. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at the dual of a stochastic program, which itself will be stochastic. So you're faced with questions like, if I know the distribution, if I know the stochastic structure here, what can I say about the stochastic structure of the dual. This is a question, to the best of my knowledge, no one knows how to answer this question. Even simple things like what, what will be the correlation structure, if you assume that the epsilon are independent, what about the, the w w shall I have independence on the stochastic structure on the dual part? We don't know. There is one thing, one case in which we know, which is the case which is taken to the data. Let's assume, in addition, this very nice separability property. In this case, we have a result. So that's the case we take into the data. And you know, we could discuss the, the, what, what it means, but let, let me not go there. Uh, as uh, Luis alluded to, uh, I like theories to be testable. So the next question is, is this theory testable? And if you just look at the model like this, the great thing with this kind of structure, and that was already in the paper by Chu and Sayo, and actually in an old paper by Daxvik, is that this mat the, econ the econometrics of this matching model, which in, in principle is very complex because you have, you have, you have these two-sided aspects, if you make this assumption, you can, it boils down to a series of logic regressions. So your life is much, much simpler. In a sense, it's a bit too simple because what you find is that 
uh, the model is vastly under-identified. Even if you put very strong parametric restrictions, it's, uh, it's not identified. So if you want to uh, get identification, one thing to do, one way to, to go, is to use uh, what IO people call the multi-market approach. You know, in, in IO, you got the single market approach and you got the multi-market approach, and if you assume several markets, you got much more identification power. That's exactly what you can do that. Now, in a nutshell, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna compare the labor market for uh, a bunch of cohorts uh, from people born in the, in the 30s to people born in the 70s, and that's what we're gonna do. Now, if you do that, and if you want to get uh, uh, identification, you need two things. You need, first of all, that the, the marginal distribution change. So it's something like the structure is the same, but the marginal changes so we can identify everything. Uh, the structure will not be exactly the same. I will be a bit more precise in a minute. Uh, but you need at least restriction on how the surplus varies throughout time, and I will be a bit more precise. Well, I, I'm going to be more precise right now. So, this looks a bit unfriendly, but actually it's, it's pretty clean. Uh, remember, this is the deterministic part of the matching. It only depends on the education of the wife and the education of the husband, and there is a T because we look at different cohorts. So the question is, how does this animal vary across cohorts? So the first thing is you put trends, which are education-specific for women, education-specific for men, and this can be anything you want. It's non-parametrically identified. And then there is what we call the supermodular core, which is this, this guy here. Remember, what we care about is supermodularity. Those, those, those guys here don't change anything to the supermodularity. Supermodularity has to do so, uh, with, with the cross derivative. So what drives supermodularity is this. So you take a model like this, the economic translation of a model like this is the structural determinant of, of assortative matching i.e. the supermodularity of the surplus, doesn't change over time. This will be strongly rejected. So the milder version is, it does change over time, but in a linear way, so you put a linear trend. <coughs> Those are the models we take today. Now, remember I was, I was talking about when we saying uh, we have the same matching patterns, we use the same matching patterns uh, in the 2005 as, we, as, as uh, in 1960, it's not easy to define what we mean by the same matching patterns. Here you can do it. Same matching pattern would be we use the same Z0. And what I like here is that it's a very applied, imprecise notion, something like are people more willing to match assortatively now than they used to? And because of this structure, we give it a very precise, clean, mathematical definition. In the remaining five minutes that I have, I will show you the data. So, uh, I had prediction on time use, I had uh, prediction on, on matching patterns, and then if they're satisfied, I would like to see what's going on the marital college premium. This is a structural model, so I can simulate, right? So let's start with time use. USA, Canada, UK, uh, two generations, 30 years, about uh, 25 years apart from each other. Uh, domestic chores and childcare. So first of all, it's, it's exactly the case, in, actually in the three countries, that the time spent by women decreased a lot and the time spent uh, by, men uh, by men increased a little bit. So total time decreases, but that's the composition of much less by women and uh, slightly more by men. It's still the case that women spend more time than men on chores, but the difference has decreased a lot. What's really spectacular is this thing. Let's look at time spent on childcare. Let's first look at married women, uh, depends on, depending on the age of the, of the child, 0. 0.65 to 113 and 163 to 276.7. Remember, this is during a period in which the wage of the women has been increasing big time because of their education and because of return on education. So the cost of those investments has increased a lot. Nevertheless, they invest more. But even, it's even more spectacular for men, this is, multiplied by 1.5, it does not exactly double, whereas in the case of men, it's multiplied by a factor of three. So in terms of time use, it's, well, the kind of prediction we had is exactly in the data. What about matching patterns? This is a graph that I, that I love because it's something that many people don't realize. This is the proportion of couples in which the husband and the wife have the same education. Those are the couples in which the husband is more educated and those are the, the couple in which the wife is more educated. 
Well, it's always the same trend, right? So those I will call the traditional couples and those one I will call them the new couples. But the point is that something that, that, that disregarded, often disregarded, nowadays, among couples in which the spouses don't have the same education, it's more likely to be the case that the wife is more educated than the husband than the opposite. This graph here gives you pretty much the essence of our result. It's just descriptive. I'm descri describing the data, but, uh, but the story is there. So let's, let's spend two minutes on this trying to understand exactly what's going on. This is the marriage pattern of men. And by the way, white men, we do the same with blacks. The marriage pattern and the evolution has been completely different. I don't have time to talk about this, but uh, we put, we look at men in various uh, level of education, high school dropout, high school graduate, some college, college, and college plus. Each of them is a rule. Left hand side, it's the cohort born in, the for in uh, 1940. L uh, right hand side, the, the cohort born in 1970. Now, take, take those guys. The gray area here represent the proportion of those guys whose, whose wife is high school dropout. This is the proportion whose wife is one notch above, i.e. high school graduate, and so on and so forth. Now, the way you interpret this kind of model is, take those guys. Those are the guys with some college. Marrying blue means marrying up. If they, if they, this is the percentage of, of uh, couples in which given the, the percentage of men with uh, some college whose wife is also at the some college level, and everything blue means that they have been marrying to someone who's more educated. Over time, this proportion has more than doubled. And it's true up there, it's true up there, it's true everywhere. In particular, the probability that you would marry at the same, here you cannot marry up because you are at the top, but the probability that you, got, you, you, uh, you would marry at the same level was something like 25%, now it's more like 45%. Keep that in mind, this is for men. Let's look at women. Exactly the opposite. The proportion has been decreasing. The, the light blue area has been decreasing a lot. Let me tell you an anecdote. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, uh, I was at a dinner at a friend's house, and I had the privilege of being seated uh, next to Bobby uh, Solo, the, the wife of Bob Solo. And you know, she's, she's a very impressive lady. She had a PhD, she had, she's Solo's generation. And in this generation, it was unusual for a woman to have a PhD, to continue working, to have kids, and so on. We started discussing about of course, without the graph, without the equation, and so on. So I tried clumsily to explain what I was, what I was doing. And at some point, she interrupted me, and she told me, well, let me, let me summarize your paper, and you tell me if I'm right. And she gave the best summary of my paper I ever heard. In my time, she says, it was OK to be a nurse, because you had, you, had a, you had a good probability of marrying a surgeon. Now, there is so much competition from female surgeon that you can marry, you can forget about marrying a surgeon. That's exactly what those graphs are telling you. It's in the data big time. Now think of the impact of this on the return to education. Let's start with men. Being assumed that part of the gain is marrying up. In this kind of model, the, the more educated your, your spouse, the better you are. As, as you would expect, that's due to supermodularity and so on and so forth, right? So if you're one of those men, not being educated is bad news because it's very unlikely that you will marry up. 30 years later, things are much better. But this means that the cost of being uneducated is much less now than it used to be. Women, it's exactly the opposite. The cost of being uneducated in terms of probability of marrying a, a, an educated husband is much higher now that it used to be, which means that the returns to education, the marital return, have increased. That's in the data. You know, there is, there is no construction here. Those are raw data. But this seems to suggest that the kind of explanation we have in mind seem to fit the data. Now, in addition, 
you can estimate the model, you can compute the joint surplus. You realize one thing that, that I like a lot, that the, in the modern couples, the surplus has increased, whereas in the traditional couples, the surplus has decreased, which is exactly this trend that the trend is women tend to be more educated than men, and the typical couple more and more will be either they have the same education or the wife is more educated. And what this is telling you is it's, it's really in the determinants of what's going on. This is about the share of the wife. And uh, at the end of the day, you can compute the marital college premium. This is a double difference. So that's the, the difference of surplus between be having a college plus education and having a college education. This number for women minus the number for men. So it's the asymmetry between genders. And you see that it's increasing if you test the, the trend is strictly positive. So we got this difference in trend in returns to education that goes in the favor of women and that could explain what we have. Let me spend one minute on the, so I was talking essentially of the first paper. Let me talk about the second paper, which I, which I like a lot. It's even more ambitious uh, because in a sense, here we're estimating the model from, from marital patterns. So it's something of, of a reduced form model. The next thing you can do is, if you use data, like panel data, or pseudo panel data, in which you observe behavior, in particular in which you observe labor supply, well, this tells you a lot, right? Because if you observe labor supply, you can recover utilities. That's, you know, standard identification. But if you recover utility, you recover the surplus, at least the economic component of the surplus. So it's the same identification problem with the difference that you have an independent identification for the total surplus. So the identification is more robust. Uh, the representation of human capital is much higher because there, is, there, is, there are plenty of unobserved component in human capital and here you can recover them. And uh, even more interestingly, you can structurally estimate a model of investment decision. So that's what we're doing, and I'm not going to inflict the result on you, but let me just move to the conclusions. First of all, human capital accumulation as a key role, which is even more important now than it used to be. Now, not surprisingly, you know, I'm a for former University of Chicago professor, so it's not completely surprising that I'm talking about human capital, but, but I really think that, that, that it's, it plays a huge role in explaining what we observe. Uh, the structure of household production has changed. Not, so, not only the structure itself, but the respective importance of the various aspects of this. This has resulted in changes in matching patterns, which in self uh, and themselves have uh, lead, led to changes in uh, incentive to invest. Unlike the labor market college premium, what's going on on the, on the marital side has been asymmetric across gender, and that could explain the, the puzzle. And if you want to try to predict what will be going on during the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years, I think you got a kind of uh, direction which could be uh, interesting. That's my conclusion. Pierre-André has kept very carefully to the timetable so that leaves us time for a couple of questions, if anybody has any questions they wish to raise. Okay, I certainly have a question. Now, I've listened to this, and I've discovered matching causes inequality. We care about inequality and wish to reduce it. Does that suggest we should have some public policy to oh. intervene in the market for matching? Thanks a lot. Uh, that's, a t that's a tough one because uh, if, I, if I was to answer, I should uh, be more precise about what kind of policy could intervene on the market for matching, and that, that's not an easy question. But I still think that there is a huge role for, for public policy. And le let me tell you both what my concern is of what the evolution would be if we don't do anything and what kind of public policy could address that. And by the way, this, what I'm going to tell you now has been very much influenced by many discussions I had with uh, Jim Heckman. One thing we know, which is implicitly assumed or explicitly assumed in this model, but there is more and more uh, empirical confirmation of this, is in those kind of human capital accumulation process, 
the various factors tend to be complement. Now, in this model, we assume that marital, uh, husband and wife, time, and human capital are complement. If you go one step further, and you, you, you write more, the more precise model, which is what, what, what Jim has been doing with Flavio Cunha and, and other people, uh, you realize that the, the, the process of accumulation at any given moment depends on the current stock of human capital, something like innate uh, ability, the background of the parents, and the investment. And most models tend to tell you that at least after the age of 10, those factors are complement. Now, what does it mean in terms of investment? It seems that it means that it's good for everyone to invest. But it's especially important and it's especially fruitful to invest for people at the top. For those kids who have a good innate ability, a good background, and have received enough uh, training when they were little, the return to investment is much higher than for anybody else. And with this kind of mechanism in which you have assortative, this kind of increase in, uh, in, uh, in uh, inequality on the marginal population result in even more uh, in a uh, uh, stronger tendency toward assertive matching, therefore additional incentive to invest and so on and so forth. The prospect we have here is a huge evolution of society toward more inequality. And the inequality I'm talking about here is not the, the Piketty type of inequality that the 0.1% of wealthiest people are becoming insanely rich. That's true and I don't really care. What we have here is that, no, but I mean, the, my point, Maybe it's bad, I don't know. But what I find really shocking is we have a situation in which opportunities will become much better for people at the top of the distribution, for kids born at the top of the distribution, and much worse comparatively for kids at the, at the bottom of the distribution. And this, I view it as a very serious social threat. So what can we do? What kind of policy? This is a 100% Heckman response. The good news is before the age of 10, or maybe before the age of five, but very early, the factors are not complement their substitute. So if you can invest a lot in correcting the inequality early enough, you can reverse the mechanism. And you know, those process of amplification, they, both, they, both, they, they, they work in both directions. If you manage to, to, to decrease inequality very early, this process will, will increase the uh, will um, emphasize the decrease in inequalities throughout the process. So that's that, you know, Jim has been saying for the last 20 years, if you want to fight inequality, if you want to, to favor human capital accumulation, in particular among, among poor people, you must do that very early. The best way of spending public money is to spend public money on very early education in those kids coming from very unfavorable backgrounds. And I think if there is one conclusion, the policy conclusion that I will draw from all this literature, it, it would be this one. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we should thank Pierre-André again for a really thought-provoking talk that more than lived up to my expectations. So thank you very much. <laughs> Before we leave, I would like to say a few words on behalf of APET. First of all, I'd like to thank our local organizers for their willingness to host a conference, for all the effort they put into organizing the conference, and for making us feel so welcome in Rio. I believe I've had an absolutely excellent time here, and I'm sure everybody else has, so thank you very much. <laughs> I would also like to thank all of you for supporting the conference for supporting the Journal of Public Economic Theory as authors and referees. If Myrna was here, I know she would talk about community and how important community is. And I always agree with her. We are a community of scholars, and it takes everybody to contribute to that community to make it work. So we are all thankful, and I'd like to thank you personally and on behalf of APET. And as a final announcement, I would just like to say, I hope to see you all again in Paris next year. It should be another excellent conference. And I'd like to thank the representatives of Paris for their willingness to host 
APET 2017. So thank you very much.